everyone. We're going to get started. I'm Morgan Penny Smith for the Municipality of Shelburne, and we thank you for coming out this evening to learn all about import replacement. So I have the pleasure this evening of introducing three people from the Center for Local Prosperity. They are three of the four authors who conducted an Atlantic Canada two-year study on import replacement, and they will give the results of that study this evening. First is Robert Cervelli, who is co-founder of the Center for Local Prosperity, where he is the executive director. He is also a co-founder and the chair of Transition Bay St. Margaret's, part of the worldwide transition movement, which works to build resiliency and adaptability in local communities. Robert is a tech entrepreneur and has been active in community building and local economics for over 35 years. Dr. Karen Foster is a professor of sociology at Dalhousie University, where she holds the Canada Research Chair in Sustainable Rural Futures for Atlantic Canada. She is establishing the Rural Futures Research Centre there this year. Her current research looks at such issues as youth out migration from rural Atlantic Canada and intergenerational succession in rural family businesses. Gregory Hemming is a co-founder of the Centre for Local Prosperity. He currently holds the position of Senior Advisor to the Centre. He is a Municipal Councillor for the Municipality of the County of Annapolis and in that position serves as Council's representative on the Municipal Climate Change Action Plan Committee, is chair of the Economic Development Committee, and the Annapolis County Forestry Advisory Committee. Please welcome them. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to do a tag team presentation. It's going to go for maybe 30, 35 minutes. And then we want to open it up for some discussion. And I think we'll give you a lot of good material to talk about. And what we're going to do, Ethan here is our filmmaker. He's going to be filming the event. And the lighting was such that it was all or nothing. And so we've arranged some mood lighting here. <laughs> <laughs> which um, I think it's going to work. Um, it's going to work beautifully. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, so why don't we hit the lights, and um, I trust you can all still see me. Does this look like it's going to work? Yep. Okay, good. Um, first, before we get going, a little bit about the Center for Local Prosperity. We're about four years old. We started with the idea of a large regional conference, which we did about three years ago in Annapolis Royal, local prosperity conference with 45 speakers from across the region talking about a lot of the good local community building, local economic activities going on. We did a second conference in Miramichi about a year and a half ago. We just finished a uh, large public retreat on climate change at the Thinker's Lodge in Pugwash just last fall. And then of course today we're rolling out this large study on import replacement. So it's a lot of what the center does. It's all about local communities and local economics and rebuilding and relocalizing those economies. Um, so I want to start out with this first slide here. Um, I had to search for strips. Okay, This is not a security question, but it's all about commercial strips. And we've all seen strips like this. You've driven down them. All the big brand names, you know what they look like. Uh, this one I had to look for because the problem with a lot of commercial strips when they all look the same is you have cultural homogeneity and you also have economic homogeneity really almost across all of North America. So I found this one. It's got mountains in the background. So it's the only way you can give it a sense of place. They go, oh, wow, well, it's out west somewhere. And in fact, it's Canmore, BC. But without the mountains, you really wouldn't know where you were. And what's happened with our local economies is that they've been very quietly co-opted by um, uh, international um, structures that are very efficient at aggregating wealth into a central office from consumer spending. So that's a lot of what we see happening. So it's really a question of how do you regain control at the local level of what economies are all about. 
So I want to diverge and talk about balance of trade because this becomes important, important even at the local level. We talk a lot about national balances of trades, so it's a balance. You've got exporting on one side, you've got importing on the other side, and it is literally like a balance. And if it goes out of balance, if you have to import more than you can export, you're in a negative trade balance, or what they call a trade deficit. And that means that money is going out of the country or out of the region faster than it's coming in, so that you're losing wealth over time. Canada has a mild negative trade balance or trade deficit, but even more importantly, when you come to the provincial level now in Atlantic Canada, this is some of the statistics that's in our report. We looked at imports and exports in each of the four Atlantic provinces. If you look at Nova Scotia, you can see that we're importing about $16 billion a year, goods and services coming into Nova Scotia, and we're exporting just under $11 billion in value, leaving the province but we have a trade deficit of about 4.8 billion. So that um, has an effect on the overall health over time of the economy in Nova Scotia, at least at the provincial level. But it's the same thing now at the community level. So we're calling national, provincial, now we're gonna get down into the region and in, even into small communities. And in fact, what tends to be the case in small communities is they have an even worse trade balance. There's much more money flowing out of the community by having to buy things in from imports than there is having the ability to sell something and export it out. So one of the analogies we use is small communities tend to be like leaky buckets. So you've got money coming in the top, that's because you're exporting, you're selling something to somebody else outside of the region. It doesn't have to be outside of the country. It could even be an hour or two down the road. You're selling a good or a service, so you're exporting dollars coming in. That's good. But then the problem is there's a whole lot of leaks in the bucket. So there's a lot of money flowing out because a lot of things have to be imported, and that's money that is leaving. So that is the balance of trade, and it we tend to not recognize it at the community level, but it's something, it's a way to think about how do you rebuild a healthy economy locally. Easiest way, if you can't export more, you just plug leaks. So I want to talk about import <coughs> replacement. Simplest definition, you're plugging the holes in the bucket. You're stopping the money leaking out by making goods and services locally that you would have to buy otherwise and import them into your economy. So that's a very simple way to think about it. Um, we all know what export means, that side of the balance of trade. Now importing, if you replace those imports, that's also equally as valuable as exporting. So to think about it in another way, this is a schematic here. Um, you've got the community, and the community has an ability to produce things. Could be anything. Could be goods and services. It could be uh, professional services, lawyers, accountants, that kind of thing. It could be boxing rock beer. It could be lobsters. Whatever it is, we're producing something. Could be a factory. Doesn't matter. There's value being created here for the community. So you've got the export model where it's a non-local sale, somebody outside of town is gonna buy it, and dollars come in, that's good. You got money flowing into the economy. Um, and that's what every community would like to have as much as possible, and it's the main strategy for most economic development agencies, is drive more export. But what we're saying is, uh, the problem now is, if you're importing, that same dollar will leak back out of the community because you have to buy goods and services back into the community. So if you replace those imports 
with something that you make locally, you're keeping an extra dollar in the economy instead of it's leaking out and staying. So water now is circulating in the bucket and it's not leaking out. So that's just a little bit of background um, on what import replacement is. So when we did this study, we took two approaches, uh, kind of a top down and a bottom up. The first thing we did was look at leakage analysis at the provincial level, all four Atlantic provinces through a database called Implant. The second thing we did was get into communities, we picked four of them, one in each of the four Atlantic provinces, Shelburne was one of those, to really see what's going on at the local level with those economies. So I want to present some information first on the leakage analysis that we did. Um, what Implan does is it looks at 110 sectors that get broken down. This is a, um, a database that's managed by a company called Implan. They collect statistics from countries around the world by province. They try to get as much granularity as they can. 110 sectors so you can see what's being imported, what's being exported and you can determine how self-reliant is each sector. And what do we mean by self-reliance? Let's say, for example, that in Shelburne County, you can produce 100 pounds of apples. Well, that's good. But let's say that people consume 1,000 pounds of apples. So you've got to import the rest. So you're only 10% self-sufficient in apples. So that's an example. We do that for all 110 sectors and we can create all of the statistics. So we look at leakage across Atlantic Canada. <coughs> We've got the four provinces. If you look at Nova Scotia, the total demand of everything that has to be purchased in Nova Scotia is about $45 billion a year. And um, we are currently locally producing almost 30 billion a year made in the province to meet that demand. But we have to import just under 16 billion has to be imported, which means our economy leaks 35 percent. So we're actually better than the rest of the other four Atlantic provinces, but we're still leaking about a third of everything going out of the province. Now, what would happen if all that leakage, you shifted it by 10%, meaning that we produce 10% more locally within Nova Scotia of all of that unmet demand. This is what would happen. We would get 15,000 new jobs created in Nova Scotia just by a 10% shift. And you could argue, is 10% too conservative? Is it not conservative enough? You know, who knows? But it's a good number to start with. It would create 877 million, almost 0.9 billion in labor income, additional labor income. It would produce 1.4, almost 1.5 billion in additional value added into the economy and about 67 million in indirect business taxes for governments. So clearly there's an economic benefit here just from a 10% shift for import replacement. And we look at that on employment. So Nova Scotia, 15,000 jobs. Uh, two years ago, their unemployment was just under 40,000 people in Nova Scotia. So that many new jobs would fill 38% of the total um, unemployed. So we would solve a significant part of the unemployment problem. So then I did the math thinking, well, how much in Shelburne County would this be? 15,000 unemployed. So Shelburne County has about 1.5% of the population of Nova Scotia. I did the math. Okay. And so a 10% shift would mean 218 additional jobs just in Shelburne County. Now that's at a high level, kind of big 
numbers, estimates. We could drill down even further and try to be a little more precise by getting into each of the sectors. But it just gives you an idea. 10% more local shopping and local goods and services creates 218 more jobs in the county here. <coughs> So, uh, what I'd like to do at this point is turn it over to Karen, and she's going to talk about the other part of the study, which was the case studies. Okay. Uh, so, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming out tonight. Um, I've just got a couple slides to talk about the, um, the component of the research that I led. Um, so, basically it started because we were looking at theories of import replacement, and, um, and looking at some of the numbers from the implant, um, the early uh, implant analysis and saying, if this is such a no-brainer, then why are communities not already doing it? There have to be some, some barriers um, to increasing local production and local consumption. Uh, and as a sociologist, um, what I was thinking is, what are the social and cultural factors that might um, constrain and enable import replacement from becoming um, a viable strategy in some smaller communities in, uh, in Atlantic Canada. Um, so we held um, from 2016, April 2016 to April 2017, we hold, held um, eight um, focus groups more or less. I'll get into the differences in a second, but uh, in Miramichi, Shelburne, and Surrey PEI, uh, we held two focus groups in each of those three communities. One focus group with uh, business and government representatives and another focus group with uh, what we were calling ordinary residents. There ended up being a lot of overlap um, between the two groups. Um, and, uh, and they both, um, uh, the groups tended to focus on just the, the, um, the question of um, what um, encourages or inhibits local consumption, what are the barriers that small businesses face um, when they try to set up, um, what are the obvious gaps in, uh, um, uh, in local production, like what are the obvious local demands that are not being met currently with, local, uh, with locally owned businesses. Um, and uh, the only difference, I guess, between the two types of group is that the community ones tended to focus a bit more on the consumption side of things, whereas the business and government groups tended to focus a little bit more on policy. Um, but really, because everyone who works in business and government is also a consumer, uh, and many of the other, uh, the ordinary residents had uh, small businesses um, or had some experience you know, dealing with them, uh, they all tended to speak to the same issues. Um, in Buren Peninsula, Newfoundland, we had to take a slightly different approach. We uh, tried to set up two focus groups um, in the first year, and um, as a result of, um, uh, I think we had some, some weather problems, and then we also had uh, um, issues just recruiting enough people for the two, um, the two focus groups. Um, we instead set up a working group that we um, started to engage with um, over email, um, and, uh, and got them working on some of these questions in advance. And then we went to the Buren Peninsula and met them, and then we had a town hall style meeting in the evening where we presented some of what we've been talking about during the day and got some more feedback from, from a wider audience. Um, so across all of these four um, communities, we had 83 people participate. Um, so there were anywhere from six to 12 in each of the focus groups uh, and 15 in the town hall style meeting. Uh, so, um, I'll skip, I guess, right to the, the findings. Um, what we found, I guess, overall was that people in these communities are not, um, import replacement just seemed um, like a no-brainer to them. They were already thinking about all of these things. Um, they identified um, what I came to understand as the absurd story of um, communities that excelled in producing or harvesting or, um, uh, you know, um, uh, fishing per se, uh, um, perhaps, um, something that they then couldn't acquire locally. You know, they exported all of it out. Um, uh, another example was like um, tourist tchotchkes that were being produced in China and you know uh, tourists that come were not able to find something local to take home for themselves um, and people just thought that this was absurd you know they have all of these resources and they're not using them um, for local uh, demands or even to satisfy um, tourist uh, consumers 
Um, so uh, people were not at all surprised by this idea of import replacement. Um, and they wanted to solve problems. They wanted to plug the leaks in their community. Um, and around the same time, I was hearing a lot of arguments um, from other uh, studies in the province um, that were saying that like rural communities just had this bad attitude, that they are risk averse, um, that they didn't understand the need for change. And uh, our data really spoke uh, against that and showed that people are having these, these conversations in communities um, and that what they bump up against instead are, are structural um, conditions that are not about anybody's you know, bad attitude or risk aversion about starting a business. Um, so uh, import replacement, in other words, it's, it's intuitive. People understand the need to plug the leaky bucket. Um, they want more local control. They want economic diversity. Um, the other thing that uh, that came out not only in the in the um, in the focus group data, but also in some supplementary um, statistical data, is that uh, rural places are are already more entrepreneurial. Um, they have higher rates of self-employment. Um, you know, pe people are starting. They're taking risks. They're starting businesses. Um, they're trying to meet local demands. Um, so again, it's not it's not that rural individuals are doing anything wrong per se. Um, it's more about the structural conditions that they're working with. Um, so what we, what we found were some, some consistent problems. Um, people who tried to start businesses or new people who did said that it was hard to find um, or attract staff. Um, uh, red tape and government regulations were one of the biggest issues that, that uh, came out. So um, it varies by industry and by community. Um, but people were able to point to um, just these really prohibitive and to them silly barriers against starting up businesses, um, particularly in and around um, tourism. Um, uh, also problems with insurance um, for certain tourist activities. Um, and what, what came out uh, in, in the aggregate of all of these is that a lot of the policies that were frustrating local communities were biased uh, against small locally owned businesses and in favor of, of um, bigger businesses, so the businesses that you see on the strip. Um, and uh, let's see, the other issue was um, what, what I termed competing in a shrinking development space, um, but um, in, uh, in the focus groups it was really about the fact that there are big companies that are meeting um, demands that are uh, with um, goods and services that we import um, and that it's really hard in a small community to break into that um, with, uh, with small local production. Um, so the space uh, for economic development is shrinking because uh, small businesses are being edged out by these bigger guys. Um, and I mentioned insurance and liability costs already. I think that was okay. Um, the, uh, I guess the final point that I will make is um, uh, one of the interesting things that we got from visiting small communities is that um, there are rural uh, ways of life. Um, some of them are, are you know, kind of stereotypical, but they, they exist in the stories that rural communities tell about themselves um, that already lend themselves to the, the kind of um, ethos that underlies um, uh, import replacement. Um, so there's a, there is an intuitive kind of sense in rural communities about what a community needs, um, you know, what kind of new business would do well, um, what kind of demands are not being met, um, and a lot of the time decisions about um, what can start up um, or what eventually moves in are made so far away from the community that they end up being out of step with the, with the local needs that people are already really attuned to. Um, and the other piece of rural wisdom that we, that we um, kind of stumbled on was that people understand um, when you are uh, living in a, in a rural community the need for, um, for diversification in your own livelihoods but also um, in, in the economy itself. Um, so some of the best um, and most successful examples we saw of businesses were businesses that had, um, uh, uh, had diversification built right into their own plan. So they did more than one thing um, and they made it so that individual people didn't have to um, be jacks of all trades um, 
uh, and they didn't bear the brunt of, of that pressure, um, but the business did. So um, one of my favorite examples is a fisherman's cooperative in Petty Harbor um, in, uh, in Newfoundland that had uh, uh, obviously had some trouble after the cod moratorium and instead of um, uh, you know, all of the fishermen you know, going out and finding trades on the side, the, the cooperative itself said, well, how can we diversify our activities? They had property, um, they started renting out part of their property to uh, a microbrewery and a, a touch tank, um, uh, and uh, I think they were renting it out as well as event space. Um, and they had just, they started to invest in other activities when, um, when their primary activity of fishing wasn't uh, so lucrative, um, and they seemed to be hanging on. Um, so that's just one example of where um, wisdom that's always kind of existed in rural places gets put to use toward um, um, business success. I think that might be. Yes, now we're back on to Bob's slides. Um, so yeah, in, in all, we gained an understanding, I think, in the, in the focus groups um, that communities are ready for this, um, and it's just going to take some of the strategies that I think Bob will talk um, about um, to kind of coordinate all of that feeling into some action. So what we did um, in this study is we wanted to bring it home to examples of what's actually happening around the region, not just the region, but the rest of Canada and, and even internationally for that matter, um, so that people really get the idea of how do you start to do import replacement. Um, so we looked around the region, um, and these are spelled out in the study. Uh, they tend to focus around energy and food, which, curiously enough, are the two most important things we need to keep going every day. Um, and they're also the easiest to replace if, if they have to be imported. So energized Bridgewater, it is now their economic development plan to become energy neutral. 500 million of investment in the next 38 years, and they will be an exporter of energy. So it starts with import replacement, and then it turns into exporting. And that's one of the key features of import replacement. When you build local capacity, local expertise, you displace imports, you get really good at it, next thing you know, you're exporting. Um, so it fits that export model, but you have to start with building that local capacity. So Bridgewater's on it. Summerside, lo and behold, they lead any community in all of North America today for energy independence. 46% of their electricity they produce themselves on their own grid using wind power. Act4 is a small company in New Brunswick that is now harvesting uh, sustainable closed canopy um, forest management techniques they're taking the waste from those thinnings and doing institutional heating. So there's, I think, eight projects now in Prince Edward Island. These are schools, public buildings, et cetera. And it's the most efficient use of wood is for space heating. So that they're, uh, again, uh, using local source of energy for, for that purpose. Shorefast Foundation, incredible work going on in Fogo Island with a charity that has now created three businesses, which are social enterprises, meaning all the profit gets plowed back into the community for further growth of the community. So they're doing quite a well, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. There's some incredible stuff going on in local food. Um, an example, one that I love the best, one woman in Cocan, New Brunswick, uh, six years ago, was fed up with the quality of the food <coughs> in the kids' cafeteria. She said, that's it can't take it anymore. So she started talking to the local farmers. Scroll forward, 75% of the Francophone elementary schools in the province of New Brunswick now source all their food locally. And they're teaching the kids how to cook the food, okay? The province now has stepped up and said, hey, let's make this a province-wide program, do with all schools, and not even just schools, but we get into other uh, public institutions as well. It started with one person. So some incredible stuff going on in the region <clears throat> with food. Preston in England, about the size of Halifax, okay? They hit the skids 
about five, six years ago. I mean, rock bottom on their economy. They were desperate, had no idea what to do. Some of the big companies packed up and left. One counselor said, all right, we're going to do guerrilla localism, they called it. So they started to talk to everybody. They approached six of the public institutions, and they said, we want you to now start doing local procurement. Whatever you need, first choice is to buy locally. Four years later, they now have increased local spending $150 million a year, each and every year, staying into the local economy and pressing. So that's an example of power when you really get on it, you really focus, and you really start to take it apart. Here is a brilliant idea. came out of Fogo Island. Anything that they make, they put a label on it. Okay? So this is out of their wood shop. Great wood shop. Um, makes furniture. So if you want to buy a puppy table, and I'm not even sure what a puppy table is, but it probably looks cute, I would think. Um, labor, production, and you break it down into terms of where the money got spent. Okay? And there's 15% surplus, which is another way of saying profit. So they made 15% profit selling you this table. Okay? But the really cool part now is enlarge this bottom part, economic benefit distribution. That's where the money goes. That's where it stays. Okay, so Fogo Island, 70% of the benefit stays on Fogo Island. That's where they made it, that's where the benefit stays. 8% rest of Newfoundland, okay, they'll give up 20% to Canada, and only 2% goes to the rest of the world. Now, I would wager you go into any product you buy online or at a big box, it's going to be the exact opposite. That's leakage. This is plugging leaks. So, really an idea, and it's a beautiful consumer education. It's just like the nutrition label when you buy food, same thing. So, anything that's coming out of the county here, made locally, should have this on there. And it really builds that community pride in terms of what you can do. So, what we have noticed doing the focus groups and what we notice other communities that are ahead of the curve do is they sit down and they have conversations. It could, I, there's some brilliant movement, international movements literally started with two women having tea at the kitchen table, literally, and it went from there. Any kind of a conversation, it could be a chamber meeting, it could be people at the coffee shop, but you have to have conversations, you have to talk about this stuff, and then magic starts to happen. We really think that's the case. So um, that's, I think, a very important part of everything um, in terms of moving all of this. And my, um, um, my challenge is I'll buy the coffee out of my own pocket. I'll buy the coffee if there's a group that starts to sit down locally here starts talking about import replacement. And what we have to keep in mind is this is not the government's job. They can help, but the really good stuff happens with residents. It's turning the consumer word into the citizen word so that you actually take some inspiration and responsibility for you live and, and that passion and kind of really latch on. Um, an example is the live well challenge. Was that one guy started that? And what are they pushing a million dollars? I think it's over maybe it's I don't know. Sure. I didn't check in lately, but it's, it's over eight hundred. Yeah. yeah, one over person. Thousand people involved. Yeah. Children, everyone from different walks of life. Yeah, so uh, you know, a good idea. It doesn't take many people mm -hmm. to really get something going. So it's really having those conversations. So then we looked at how do you implement? Where do you start? What do you do? The first thing is those conversations. If people aren't talking to each other, then nothing happens. And you can pretty much look at communities around the region where not much is going on. And it's people just don't, maybe they're not watching too much TV or whatever, but they're just not talking. And so you got to have those conversations in some sort of ongoing way. Then 
some areas have started, maybe they don't call it this, but there's some sort of a group that forms. Could be just citizens, residents, it could be some government people involved, but there's some sort of a group that starts to really brainstorm what could happen. And one of the first things we recommend you do is you look at what are your community assets. And you would be amazed. We did this in Buren, Newfoundland. And by the time we had the, the whiteboard was full, we couldn't fit any more on there. And they, were, they couldn't believe it in terms of what they had to work with. Everything, empty buildings is an asset. For an entrepreneur with a good idea, that's an asset. So anything. It could be all of the volunteer organizations, nonprofit organizations in town. It could be uh, what's your entrepreneurial capacity and the, can they mentor, um, all kinds of things. Um, things that we don't normally tend to think about are assets. And of course, rural communities, the natural environment is an enormous asset. As a tourism base, as a natural resource base, whether it's fisheries, forestry, farming, all of that. You don't have that in metro, for sure. You don't have that in urban centers. So you're ahead of the curve in a lot of the assets that are available to use. Who's the people that do the axe throwing? And they're in Barrington, I think. I mean, axe throwing. Yeah. Geez, I haven't gone, I haven't gone axe throwing yet, but I might have to give it a try. Um, so then the other thing is find, those, find where the leaks are in the bucket. Talk to the big institutions, where you're buying your food from, the institutional caterer. One of the things they did in Preston, uh, okay, the, insti the, the public institution had one big contract for the institutional caterer. And that was it, one contract. Well, obviously nobody local is big enough to try to tender on that contract. You just can't do it. So what they did, this is guerrilla localism, they broke, the, broke it down into what was manageable locally. Okay? Who can supply the fish? Who can supply the potatoes? Who, you know, they just broke it right down. And they're building capacity locally. So suddenly somebody's got to take potato growing seriously because now they've got a contract. Next thing you know, they're exporting. And you've got to educate the community. That's why that label, we really like that label. And there's other ideas like that. Put signs in windows. Advertise your local businesses. Uh, there's roadblocks. There might be creative workarounds. We found one of them is food companies. If, you know, I'm making jams and jellies, I can sell them at the farmer's market, but I can't sell them in the stores because I don't have a commercially licensed kitchen, things like that. Well, that's easy. If you build one commercially licensed kitchen and you timeshare the thing, then suddenly every small food business can start to use it. So you can cooperate that way. There's a lot of workarounds that are possible. And you start with the low hanging fruit. Find one good example, do it, make a big deal out of it and build on it. So that's really, I think, uh, a lot of what we learned and celebrate those things. Um, put it in the newspaper, put it on a billboard, whatever it takes. So we want you to invite Lois into the community. Now, um, this is not a person. This is an acronym. Locally owned import substituting businesses. So we know locally owned means they're even better if they're replacing imports, if they're substituting imports. Because there's at least 10 studies done now in North America that show that a locally owned business creates two and a half times more jobs than a non-locally owned business. Now that's not just the jobs in the business, but it's all of the support services. So they're gonna hire the local accountant and the local lawyer and you know, the crafts, trades people, all that sort of thing, whereas a uh, big international business will send all that away to head office somewhere. So the multiplier effect, it's called the multiplier benefits of locally owned businesses are huge. And the other thing we learned is share the wealth. This gets into the cooperation aspect as a way to build wealth quickly by cooperating. 
you're seeing, particularly in the U.S., a lot of uh, resurgence of the cooperative business model, which we had out of the old um, um, Antigonish, um, uh, the Cody Institute, the Antigonish movement, way back in the 30s, I think it was, a big upsurge of the cooperative movement. You're starting to see it come back again, worker-owned, produce, producer-owned. And one of the benefits of cooperatively owned businesses is it embeds the, com uh, the business in the community because it's owned effectively by the community, which means the wealth stays there as well. Networks and hubs is a big one. You're starting to see more and more of that. People collaborating, whether it's online, digitally, it could be at a physical place. Co-working spaces, there's some fa fantastic ones uh, popping up. I'm from St. Margaret's Bay. They're just, the paint's still drying on our new community enterprise center started by the Seniors Association. They rented a space, remodeled it, and they're gonna turn it into a co-working space. It's called a, um, uh, these types of things are called third spaces. So it may not be your home, it may not be your business, but it's a third space where you can go and hang out, you can talk with other people, share business ideas, that type of thing. You're seeing uh, workshops and studios where, um, I'm thinking of the Makery in, in Lunenburg. Okay. Any one of those single artists could not have afforded to rent a big retail space, but there's power in numbers. They got together, formed a cooperative, and they created the Makery. So it's, you can really get somewhere and you can start to compete internationally if you can cooperate strongly enough. Online shopping platforms. <coughs> Okay, well, the last um, article I read about Amazon, the title was Amazon doesn't want to just dominate the market, it wants to become the market. Um, so you, that's who you're working against locally here. So it is possible now, there's even uh, shopcity.com is one, there's others where people can aggregate you can feature all of locally produced products so you have one site to buy local. That's possible these days. Um, any of the other groups, chambers, anyone in town should be on board um, and really supporting what kind of initiatives there are. We looked at buy local. Um, this was my phrase, putting it on steroids. We just came out of the Olympics, so maybe that's <laughs> performance enhancing buy local here. Okay, um, and every chamber at Christmas time they have a buy local campaign. But if you look at some communities, they really, really got serious about this. And so, first thing you do is you brand the effort. You make it owned by the community, some sort of create, you know, logo, tagline, the whole thing. Then you label everything that's not just goods but services as well local trades, local professional services, whatever it is. Then you educate the consumers about that, and it could even just be an extreme of putting things in everybody's mailbox. Um, you know, where, where do you take it? There's a great example out of North Carolina, same thing. One woman totally overhauled the buy local. Um, in, I think they now call it buy lo be local, think local, buy local, something. So they you know, made it a year-round thing. It's a local currency, downtown Truro dollars. They now have $150,000 of their own money circulating in their economy that they didn't used to have because they printed their own money. And there's, I can't remember now, 60, 80 some merchants that will accept it just like cash. A 10% club, some communities have done this. You take a challenge, I'm gonna spend for the next month, 10% of all my buying is gonna be local. Credit unions, some of them have stepped up and they offer a certificate of deposit on the guarantee that all of that money will get reinvested locally. So there's a lot of good ideas. Can I add, add to that from the focus groups? Just that um, what, what was overwhelming to me in the discussions was that people are um, motivated by feelings of guilt uh, to buy local and they feel terrible when they shop at Costco or wherever. Um, and so it's, it's clear to me anyway that people just need like a little nudge 
Um, you know, mo most people want to support local businesses. They understand the rationale, um, and it's just that you know it, it can be sometimes more cost effective and more convenient to go um, you know drive to Halifax and do all your grocery shopping one day a month um, but if little incentives could go such a long way just to like tipping people back into buying local it, it's a very good point every community we talked with they all had their town list mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. what I mean you know we're gonna head into Halifax or if you're in Surrey PEI you're gonna head into Charlottetown or same thing in Miramichi, you're going to go to Fredericton, you got your list, while you're there you're going to go out to eat, you're going to fill the tank with gas, spend a whack of money, but it's not in town. So that's an educational thing right there. 10%, just try to convince people, and then you're, you're starting something. So there's an idea of what are called pollinators, which is these are self-financing enterprises, so the government doesn't have to put any money into them. They pay their own way, and they're building um, that local economy. They're building import replacements. So there's some really good examples, one of which is a table back here, FarmWorks. Okay, they've already raised 1.6 million, I think, from people like you, small amounts from people like you, and they've invested in 38 businesses across the province. One of them is Boxing Rock. I think Emily's here. Um, and that is food import replacement. And it's local money getting reinvested into local businesses. So that's an example of a pollinator. We have other ones in the report. Um, so there's some really good potential there as well. So at this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Gregory. Um, and he will talk about some of the recommendations uh, for government. My slide's pretty simple. I thought, uh, let, me, let me tell you a story. Um, in uh, 2012, uh, I decided to uh, run for the position of a municipal councilor in Annapolis County. And uh, my experience over the last 20 or 30 years has been kind of as a consultant to federal governments and, and the conservatives and the liberals and the NDP and the Greens in, in one variety or another. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try local politics. So I, I made the decision to run and I, and I came home, I filled out my paperwork and I, I looked at my wife and I said, okay, what, what do we do next? He said, well, simply, we go knock on every door in this district. <laughs> Seems like a chore, but we did that. And what, what I found out is after visiting 300 and some, 360 I think, homes, one thing I discovered is that the people that, that lived in my district really do know what they want to do for a living. They, uh, they do know how they want to engage with their neighbors. They do know what they expect of a local municipality and a, and a provincial municipality. They know the regulations that make it difficult for them to make a living. And they know the incentives that if they had them, they could do better. So I took all that information and my first uh, session in council, uh, we had a discussion around the council about the new councilors and what you might be interested in. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in economic development and the councilors I said, great, there's a conference coming up in two weeks down in uh, 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 Oak Island. And it's about regional economic development, a, a, new, a new program. So I thought, great, I'll go down to there. Or I think there are 118 municipal officials and, and uh, representatives. And uh, the first part of the presentation on economic development was run by Deloitte accounting firm on a, on a huge screen and it, it said here's the the GDP going up here and here's Nova Scotia headed down here and the solution to them seemed to be that you what you have to do is you have to get this arrow that's going down here raise it up here to compete on this international scale okay well yeah, that, that was a little contrary to what I was finding out when I visited constituents door to door. So 
our, our council got together and we decided at least at this point we're not going to em embrace a, a more regional look at economic development, that we wanted to do more localized economic development or community development. But what we quickly discovered is uh, we, we didn't have a, a good data, we didn't have our own economic house in order. So we thought that's what we need to do first. So what we did is we put together an economic development committee and we sat for oh, a year, year and a half. And we really pounded away at all the alternatives, which you see all up here, local finance, local investment, uh, buy, buy local, all those sort of things that were out there. And we started to pick and choose how those might fit in Annapolis County. And we came up with an economic development strategy, really five targets. That when you look through this and you've already seen those, those five targets that I'm just going to talk about, they really touch all of these incentives, these initiatives, we, we touch all of those or have to deal with those. So what we decided with it within our committee is that in Annapolis County, and we grabbed 2050, we could have grabbed 2030, 2040, but we said by 2050, we can see Annapolis County doing one of uh, five things. One, we, we would produce 80% uh, of the energy that we consumed, we would produce that and distribute that locally within Annapolis County we would do the same thing with food. You know, right now Annapolis County is a very rich place for agricultural area and we import 85 percent of our food. It comes from another municipality, another area. Uh, that we wanted to do everything to, to provide safe, efficient, affordable housing for anyone in Annapolis County through innovative building materials, some new zoning regulations that a municipality can do. Uh, and, and the thing I was interested in, and it came up here four or five times in these slides, is the educational piece. That we wanted to put together what we called a place-based education system. That if you live in Annapolis County and you wanted to be upskilled or change occupations or professions, that, the, that we ought to find out a mechanism to bring the education system to you, to keep that local. And the last thing that we wanted to do is do everything we can to preserve and protect clean air and water. So we took those five targets and then we took them out into the community. And at the end of a year and a half process, we held 57 public meetings in, in every little corner to, to ask people who live there, are we, are we doing this right? Have we identified the right targets? Is this a way forward? And uh, we found out that, that we, we were doing this uh, the, the right way at this point. So from there I thought, you know, what I needed to do is get a lot more information on other people in other places that are doing similar things. Uh, so Bob and I and a few others got together and came up with this Center for Local Prosperity. The first conference we held in, in 2015, Bob was saying, we, we had I think 45 panelists, we had 100, or 280 people from all over the Atlantic provinces broke out to, to eight different breakout sessions from local currency to local food to local energy. And what Bob and I kind of demanded of our speakers is that, they, that they'd actually done something in their community. It wasn't just theory, that they'd actually made something happen and got some sort of results that were verifiable. And we got 45 people. It wasn't hard to do that and we were absolutely amazed of the amount of work that's going on in small communities already that are doing import replacement. They may have a different name for it, or they may be doing it in some sort of con configuration that, that may be different from the next community. But people really do know what needs to be done when it comes to import replacement. The, the, and and that, uh, Karen was one of the the first uh, people that, that signed on to that first thing, and the more we talked to Karen, it was clear to me that she had this idea as a, as a sociologist and an anthropologist and an academic. She, she had a clue into this. So we put all this together and we decided to do this, this two-year study to really give us some hard data that we could begin to talk to communities about, about what really is working. Uh, and that's really the, the meat of this subject. My interest is really in the governance piece. What, what can a local municipality do? What can the provincial government to do, uh, do to uh, either speed up or diversify a, an, an economy 
along this whole idea of producing things locally. That the, the more you can produce locally, the better off you are. We, we thought that was true. This study gives us indication that it is true. And what I was surprised is that local-based economy is much bigger than I had even dreamed it would be. These numbers are quite staggering, absolutely staggering. Uh, so that's why we're here tonight, to take this information back. We had focus groups in, in four areas, and now we're coming back into communities and saying, this is what we found out. But really, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, this, take this information back to your community, back to your council, representatives to, uh, to the province, and, and start to dig deeper in this. But, and I just want to go through some, some very targeted points on, on, on what I think a good place of beginning both for a municipal government and a provincial government are. I mean, for municipal governments, you need to revamp the, the way you pu pu uh, pro procure things, the way you buy things, make sure that it's local. I think there's things that a municipality can do. Uh, you can, Bob talked about these public spaces, make public spaces available uh, to, to do a small enterprise in. You can facilitate local investment. And, and I, I stumble on that one a little because it is, uh, it, it's a big deal to be able to do that. But when I look at the Municipal Government Act, another thing police, uh, uh, people have done, places have done, I look at the what the federal government allows, I think it's possible to do municipal banking. And municipal banking that would that would really invest in local people with local skills, and take a risk on loans that big banks won't. And I do, and I think it's possible as well to, in a sense, put capital into that local investment tool by redirecting pension funds. I mean, our pension. You have local people who make a living all their life in, in a local area, and their pension funds if they even knew where they went, it would be surprising. But a lot of what they invest in, and you don't even know it, are contrary to what you need to be doing locally. So, so we need to, pay, uh, may, need to pay attention to that. What a municipality, I think, can do in its own way is, is level the playing field for local people to be able to compete against larger enterprises. I think that's possible. Um, what can the, the provincial government do? One of the things that we're trying to do in Annapolis County, and it, it, and it looks like Bridgewater is being very successful in that, is this energy piece. How can you produce local energy for local people? The technology is there. Every house not only produces, it can, consumes electricity, but can produce electricity. If you have a roof, you can have a solar panel, wind generation. The technology is there. Um, so, so in Annapolis County, we're taking a hard look at that and looking at the Bridgewater model. But what we're thinking is to make it a total package, we need to have control of our own grid system. So we're, we're exploring a municipally owned grid system that people can invest in uh, uh, over time. I think that's a possibility. Um, Bob talked about CETAs, Community Development Investment Funds. Those are one of the smartest tools available for local people to get involved in local enterprise. Um, uh, but at, at the end of the day, I, I think putting together a partnership between the provincial government and the municipal government is absolutely vital. But I can tell you, my sense is that the, the provincial government may, may be not going that direction. Uh, that, that there may be more of a desire to centralize rather than decentralize. I think this study may give uh, food for thought uh, on why uh, that might not be the wisest course of action for local communities. And with all this said, this study and this documentation Gave, gives me great hope in the power and strength of local people and local government. Um, 
I think that's enough for now. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do the rest in a question and answer period. But uh, I want to end with, with this, and I guess I end up with it, but I think it's a good point of beginning, by an old Kentucky farmer, Wendell Berry. A lot of people probably know Wendell Berry, one of the smarter farmers, but also a very good writer. But I like this. The proper role of a government is to protect its citizens and its communities against conquest. We kind of know that, to keep ourselves secure. But it's this piece, against economic conquest, just as much as conquest by overt violence. And we kind of underestimate, the, in a sense, the heavy hand of larger economic instruments on local communities. And, and I think there are ways that local communities can start to get the upper hand again. Uh, and this study starts to give us hard data to be able to have those discussions. That's all. Awesome. Thank you.